continuing our reflection and our questioning, I thought first of coming back today to my last talk and reading aloud a couple of letters which I have received as a reaction to what I have said. They present what I have spoken of in a slightly different way or in a very different way. And it rejoiced me because the purpose of my talks is to try and have us all, each of us, reflecting on what seemed to us obvious, so habitual that there no questioning comes to our mind, and yet which is full of mystery and requires not only intellectual reflection, but also a continuous spiritual growth that would allow us to understand with new depth what is revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures, in the light and by the power of the Holy Spirit acting within us. Because it is not a matter of scholarship. It is not a matter of simple knowledge of the scriptures. The scriptures are infused with the grace of God. And it is only by communing with this divine grace, by receiving the Holy Spirit, to whom we say daily, come, and abide in us, and cleanse us from all impurity. The spirit of truth, the spirit of life, that we can understand the Holy Scriptures, which at times seem to be so simple and clear to our superficial understanding, and at times so obscure to our benighted mind, very much in the way in which a person at times to us seem to be crystal clear because we do not in this crystal like transparency see the mystery and the depths of a person or on the contrary seem to be so obscure and beyond understanding because it is only the externals that strike us. This I will leave for another occasion because before we come to this, I would like tonight to say something about the destiny of men, of men understood as anthropos, as Shalaviak, the human being. Look at what the scripture tell us about it. To begin with, let me remind you that we are told that God, by his word, called into existence all things that are. Indeed, all things that have been. And that to begin with, what he had created was what the scripture calls chaos. When we think of chaos, we think habitually of destruction, of a city destroyed by bombs, of an earthquake. We never think of chaos is a primeval condition. And yet, I think it's very important for us to realize 
that the chaos of which the Old Testament speaks is the condition of the first created world in which everything was possible. A world of potentialities that had not yet taken shape, that has not yet become a form. And we are told that on this immense, immeasurable potentialities, the Spirit of God was breathing, bringing out all the potentialities that gradually became mature. And one after the other, all the potentialities created by God began to emerge. I'm not going to describe this because it is known to all of us and easy to read in the Bible. But what is important for us is to realize that the Spirit of God was calling out all that was possible, and all that was possible gradually began to emerge in a first harmony. And then a moment came when all the potentialities which naturally could emerge under the guiding hand of God, under the Spirit of God, had been practically fulfilled. And one more step was to be taken, which was not simply one more progress of the created world. It was, as it were, a jump, a movement forward, upward, towards the depth, something that um, was not simply a progression, but a change. Man was created. And the difference between the creation of man and all other beings lies in the fact that God breathed his life into him. Man is different from all other creations because of this act of God. And man, in the sense of the human being, was, as it appears, as it understood by some or most writers, was simultaneously carrying all the possibilities of male and female. It was not two beings, it was one being still infinitely complex in which the two potentialities have not divided themselves, had not evolved to their fullness, and did not yet exist separately. And yet, he was created in the image of God. God, one in the Trinity, man, one in duality. What happened in the growth and progression of man is not described, but something must have happened because gradually a moment came when it was time for something to happen to this being who held within himself all the potentialities of male and female. The Bible tells us that God brought 
to his eyes all the created animals anything that struck man the anthropos the человек was that all of them were pairs he was the only one who was alone and when he became aware of this or the fact that there was something new that must happen to him the moment had come for god to divide this complex being into male and female we are told that god brought a deep sleep upon adam and divided him men divided men into adam and eve what strikes me in this story is that what happened was not a one-sided act of god it came as a result of the discovery by the anthropos by the человек by men that something more could happen to him that he was not yet fulfilled and it's then that god divided separated within the one being the two sexes what is remarkable is that when adam saw eve in front of him he didn't look at the new being as it were saying hey, who is she she is different from me what he said i am i and she is she she is a feminine of the masculine which i am ish and isha in hebrew she saw in her himself as it were mirrored but the mirrored vision is not a person well here it was a person who was both him and the fulfillment of him as one russian theologian has put it it was one personality in two persons one personality it was a human being that had reached the maturity that allowed this separation into two who could look at one another and recognize one another as self nothing separated them there was no opposition there is only a vision of fulfillment a fulfillment that could not take place within one of them because the richness that was possible could not be expressed within one being this was a wonder they saw in one another themselves in wonderful beauty they saw themselves fulfilled in the other they saw that together they were one person and that was the beginning of their being together 
And this is something which we know only through the scriptures, of which we have inklings from time to time. These inklings we find in the whole of history, and indeed in the life of people around us. When two persons, through loving one another, with purity of heart, with purity of instinct, become one. And yet, remain unique to each other. One of the remarkable things is that they saw one another as themselves. They did not see one another as being in opposition, but as fulfillment. It is only after the fall, and of that we have already spoken, it is only after the fall that they looked at one another and saw one another as the other one. Again, as a Russian writer has put it, when they were created, they look at one another as the alter ego, the other myself. When sin entered into their relationship, they looked at one another and saw themselves as ego, I, and the other one as alter, the other one. And this is what is signified, again, according to certain writers, in the passage in which we are told that Adam and Eve saw that they were naked. When they were one in two persons, there was no nakedness. It is only when they were different that they be, be discovered that they were alien to each other and naked. So that is something which is remarkably important in our understanding of one another. We cannot go back beyond the fall, but we can go beyond the fall in the other direction. By the grace of God, within the redemptive work of Christ, within the mystery of the church that makes us into a oneness beyond words, we can discover that we are one. Speaking in terms of <clears throat> experience and of literature. We know from literature many stories of passionate relationships in which one or the two or one uh, or both on each other pray like beasts of prey, want to acquire possession of the other, to use one another. But we also know from the same literature that a mysterious thing which we call chastity comes between people who love one another with a love which is not hunger, which is not desire of possession, but which is openness, gift of self and not an effort to possess the other. Two persons 
uniting in mutual love, both heart to heart and mind to mind, but even body to body, not as beasts of prey, but of beings that give themselves to one another totally as a most precious gift. But when the fall came, this was not the situation. It is only through the grace of the Holy Spirit, through a long struggle of mankind, that this was discovered fuller and fuller in Christ and in the Spirit. At that moment, they discovered that they were naked. That is, they were alien. One does not see oneself as naked. One can see only the other one in terms of a position. And then their whole relationship changed. The Bible tells us that Adam knew Eve, not in the sense of a more perfect, a deeper knowledge, but in the colloquial sense of a sexual possession. That was a new relationship. They were one in the beginning, as I have tried to explain. And now they became one, but on a quite different level. And this level varied. I no longer speak of Adam and Eve, but of humans in general. Between praying like beasts of prey on one another and giving oneself bodily and in soul at each other. These are the two extremes. In the interval, there was love, which at moments is a gift of self, at another moment, a moment of hunger. This is the situation of the fallen world. There is still divine light in it. There is still purity in it. But it must be conquered in order to be the whole of a human being and a human relationship. It must be conquered by a renunciation to what happened at that moment that divided the one personality <clears throat> that were two persons into two persons that must grow into one personality. And the relationship is described in the book of Genesis as a new relationship. It is no longer Adam or Eve saying to one another, you are my own self revealed to me in a beauty which I never suspected. It's a new relationship in which God says, that her longing will be for him and his overpowering presence will be over her. It is not a condemnation. The shell which we find in the English translation 
is not an order, a decision of God. It is simply a fact that these two halves are now in an uncertain relationship that can change from evil to perfection. I have said in a previous talk that the situation in which we are in this world is a twilight situation. What God has once given, he never takes away. His image in us remains, but it remains veiled. It remains in the twilight, or to use an image which I gave you once, it is like the reflection of the trees in the water. When the water is perfectly still, one can see the reflection of the trees, identical to the trees. But it's enough of a little breeze for the water to begin no longer to be still, and then what is reflected in it becomes blurred. So is the whole situation of mankind a mist, a twilight, a blurred situation. The things themselves are there, and this is the wonder of it. But we can no longer see nothing but the perfection of it. And then, gradually, death enters into the destiny of mankind. As long as they were one, one personality in two persons, in the image of the Holy Trinity, as long as they were one I'm sorry, one minute. As long as they were one, there was no opposition between them. And death had no power over them because death came as a result of this unity being broken, like an icon being cleft into two. And death began to conquer mankind. If you look Later in the beginnings of Genesis, you will find a list of the ancestors of Christ with ages that baffle us, whether are real ages or approximations or an attempt at expressing things in figures, we don't know. But what we can see, can see is that these figures that, by, that began to be great begin to grow smaller and smaller. The life of mankind grows short. And there is a passage in the Bible that says, and death conquered gradually. 
To begin with, there was still a powerful remain of the original fullness. And then, as it was gradually frittered away by sin, by imperfection, death became more and more powerful. And this is the situation in which we are. We live in a world that is, as I said already, in a mist, in twilight, like a trembling reflection on the face of the waters, but a world into which, as a result of it, death has come with power. And yet, for us, death is the last, not the last word. This is a wonder of the incarnation and the wonder of what happens through it and through the gift of the Holy Spirit and through the fact that God and mankind have never been ultimately separated from one another by human sin. Human sin proved incapable of separating us from God because our oneness with God, our closeness to him, is based on the divine love and not ours. I'm afraid I'm very tired today. And if you, I hope you will forgive me if I make an end to the talk now. We'll keep quiet for a while and pray together. And then I'll be glad to give a blessing, God's blessing, to everyone who will wish to receive it.